What up, though? We are back with another episode of Speak for Yourself. I am Dewan Dandridge. Of course, to my right, we have Ken Elkins. What's happening? And a very special guest, a really good friend of mine, Mark Van Ando. Thank you. Thanks. What up, good man? to be here. Welcome to Speak for Yourself. Thank you. So, Mark, we always like to start off by inviting our guests to introduce themselves to the audience. Um, I feel like I could probably do a decent job you do great. of introducing you, but I'd love for you to share with the audience how you would like them to know you. Great. Thanks for the opportunity. It's great to be with you all. Um, I think the important for me is relationships, which relationships define me. And so I'm a follower of Jesus and also a husband to Kristen for 26 years. Shout out and, to Kristen. Yeah. And I have three sons who are 22, 20, and 18. Mm. And uh, they provide much joy for my life. I'm a Detroiter, not a native Detroiter. I hope that I'm uh, kind of been connected. I've been paying taxes for 18 years. There you so go. That, there you uh, go. That counts for something. That'll do it. Right. That'll That's to make you a native Detroit. Yeah. <laughs> so, and Detroit's been a big part of my uh, salvation and sanctification in my life. Yeah. And I'm grateful for the people that I've met, including you, and uh, been connected to in the ways that I've been able to learn and grow by being a part of this community. Yeah. I would say 18 years of taxes is probably not what defines would, 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 would get you in, but like the way that you walk um, in your whole family, the way that you walk and move and navigate Detroit and um, have embraced the education um, as a white man not from Detroit, the way you've embraced the education and what you've done with the education, right? Because sometimes the, the things that you receive from a space when you're not from it, you can extract those things and take them on somewhere else. And I see that happen. Um, but I watch you and Kristen like give back mm. in a way where it's reciprocal. And I think that's what would have someone that is a native Detroit like myself say, no, nah, he's with us. He is us. Thank so, you. Yeah, you are a Detroiter. That, yeah. that means a lot to me. I appreciate that. I've yeah. tried to have a posture of learning and uh, listening. Yeah. And uh, also reciprocity is really important to my journey. So thank you for noting those things. Yeah. So Mark, what are you up to these days? Um, what is Mark in Detroit work? What is that looking like for you? Yeah. Uh, so I work with a church called Hesed Community Church. And uh, our church is kind of a church with a community development focus. So we're trying to be listeners in the community and respond to the needs of the community as we hear them and help uh, bring resources and encouragement and the love of God to neighborhoods that may have been disinvested for some intentional and uh, other purposes. But uh, that's kind of the work that we do. So we're active in uh, Brightmoor on the west side and Morningside on the east side. And then we've been spending some time in Highland Park recently. Okay. So we do that through... Uh, ministry houses that kind of serve as resource hubs for the community and gathering spaces for the community. Mm. And uh, we've been privileged been, to be doing that for the last seven years. And so is that with, diff do you identify different community members who host um, the services? And is it uh, at various spaces, various houses throughout uh, the year? Is it on Sunday? Like talk a little bit more about that. I'm sure. very curious. Yeah, That's yeah. The program is an interesting concept. We try and focus on relationships and on building trust and then trying to respond to who in the community are the community leaders who we try and empower and encourage and, and listen to. So depending on the community, our gatherings look differently. Um, some gather on Sunday, some gather on other parts of the week. Um, so it, it really is community specific and we try and allow the community leaders in that space to decide how the programming looks and what, what the needs are because from a neighborhood to neighborhood the needs are different and the desires are different and so we try to uh, enter into a neighborhood and build relationships with people in a way that allows them to see that our posture is trying to be come in as a neighbor not as a service provider or program planner or like so we're a little less churchy than some churches are in that regard but we try and listen well and respond as we can. So, Mark, before you it stepped in, uh, Kian has shared, and I'm going to try to go somewhere and, and tie something in to a question more than anything. K 
Kenneth shared an experience that he had when he was growing up, and uh, it sounds like there was a white suburban church that would come in. Yeah, they would come to our neighborhood, and and it's funny, and bust us out. And I just processed this, like literally I'm 48, I just processed this. Damn. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> like about a month Sorry ago, what that. happened? But they would come, bust us out of the neighborhood, wonderful, take us to the suburbs, and teach us about Jesus, you know, wonderful. But then I do remember one of the services and a couple of services, they were like, hey, you know, if your welfare is a, is is from the devil, if you're on welfare, you're going to hell. Oh, mercy. And, I, and I, at 48, I'm processing this like, wow, I was going to some kind of mind control thing, yeah. basically telling me, trying to get us all off of welfare by telling us that my mama is going to go to hell oh, because she's on welfare. And they use the word laziness. Laziness uh, is of the devil. And you know what I mean? And it's in the name was, of Christ in, in the yeah, name yeah, of yeah, Christ. Yeah, right. Yeah. And so I was just like, and again, I, it just, I don't know why that popped in my head about a month ago. And I was just like, Oh my God, I wish I can go find those people and, and do something, you know, yeah. go talk to them, go do yeah. like, why did y'all, try to do this to us yes right yeah. so yeah yeah so i guess where the question is not that you're responsible for speaking to that or mm -hmm. anything like that but have you run into any gatekeepers right because you know there are so many of us that are sensitive to kind of like the missionary yeah. model right mm -hmm. and the way that we describe it at home is that you know the missionaries come in, come in now with cameras and record the work that they're doing. They didn't come in when they were coming, like, jacking folk and taking resources, you know what I'm saying, yeah, and yeah. dividing up land, right? Um, so there, I know that there are a lot of people that are really protective the way that I would be. Um, have you run into any of that on your in your 18-year journey of – learning and loving in Detroit. Yeah, and I consider it a, a privilege when people confront me with that kind of a posture. You're like, like uh, when people have had that kind of traumatic experiences, and I've seen those traumatic experiences mm -hmm. where people are kind of on safari, right? And they're there to take their pictures and then go back and demonstrate yeah. stuff. Or people, uh, one of my mentors, she refers to them as church plantations, not church plants, but church mm -hmm. plantations that happen yeah. in the city. And so it's like a colonizing, it's a recolonizing in some cases. And so I do run into gatekeepers who question my motives and who, um, who are curious, are you here for the right reasons? And I always consider that a privilege because I'm thankful that there's gatekeepers there because there's yeah, been so much damage yeah, done, like no Ken's doubt. referencing, that no needs doubt. to be protected. And I make my own mistakes. I'm not perfect at this, but I've learned a lot. And I, it grieves me that there's stories like that that have happened. And I'm sure that I've created some of those things on my own. Yeah. But one of the beautiful spaces for me is when people test me and then they test me again and they test me again. There was a friend of mine who, when I moved to the neighborhood, she was questioning me and she was like, she was really like, I'm not gonna give you any kind of credibility. And uh, after seven years of relationship to me, with me, she said, uh, I'm gonna call you Pastor Mark now mm. because you, either you faked it for seven years or, <laughs> your, or your heart is really truly for the people. Right. And right. that was such a privilege for me. And I, again, I still stumble, I still make, ignorant mistakes. I have lots of blind spots, but I have friends who will call me on it. And I have other people who question me on it enough that I'm trying to be conscious and, and aware of the ways in which I don't see things clearly. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's one of the things that I appreciate, right. Is like the, not, not necessarily wanting someone to give you cover and a pass for a mistake, but saying, Hey, like I appreciate being called out and especially when it's in a loving way from somebody that you know cares about you, yeah. right? And not just doing it just to tear you down. Yeah. So, um, can I share a story about that? Yeah, definitely. So, uh, Tony McDuffie, who's now with the Lord, he is a dear friend and mentor of mine when I first moved to the city. And we were running a program, a summer camp program, day camp program together. And there were volunteer groups coming from the suburbs. And, um, this one group in particular started coming to me to ask me questions about what they should do. 
instead of going to Tony, who was the program director, I was an associate. I was like, but they felt more comfortable coming to me and yeah. asking me. And Tony. White man must be in charge. <laughs> well, right. yeah, totally. Right. Right. So Tony pulled me aside and he's like, that is totally disrespectful and dishonoring. And I, I need you to go back to them and tell them that that's disrespectful and that your, your receiving of that was disrespectful to my leadership and my authority. So he was gracious and kind to me in that, yeah. in that to pull me aside and to help me correct that. So I, that, it has been a gift to have people speak into my life like yeah. that. Yeah. I, I appreciate that, right? Because sometimes what we will do is we'll get pissed and we'll just go and like, talk about it amongst ourselves without pointing it out. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And that doesn't fix it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it might make us feel good in the moment for just like talking about somebody. But, you know, again, oftentimes the role that we play, we're not given credit for it, nor compensation. But oftentimes the role we play is the instructor, professor, ed educator, to our white brothers and sisters, yes. um, oftentimes doctors, if we think about racism and the way that we're taught it and it's embedded in us as a sickness, we're oft, we often play the role of physicians, uh, but we don't get those type of titles that comes along with like honor and prestige and, and all of that. Yeah. Right? Or the compensation. It's an, it's, an, it's an education that you've been given that isn't in the formal Western white way yeah but the value of it is so critical and particularly now at this time i think that we need to value that more and yeah. that's part of why i believe in black leaders detroit but we can get to that in a minute yeah, yeah. and it is good when when you know your white counterparts speak into that and speak up to that like you were just mentioning i remember i was in when i was with a, a certain organization i had a suit on and um one of my white <laughs> staff members with me he just had on regular clothes and they kept asking them questions and then finally it was like this is my boss. Why are y'all asking me? Yeah. And then it was like, oh. And I just looked, sitting there laugh. I was like, isn't this just interesting? Like, isn't yeah. that dynamic yeah. just yeah. interesting? I got a whole suit on. Right. But yeah, I'm still not your boss. Right. You know, yeah. no one still sees me as your boss. They still see you so as my boss. Yeah. Yeah. It's to no make doubt. the assumption that you just dress down today. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's just interesting. What, uh, but to something else, what's that led you on this journey, Mark? Yeah. How did you get here? Thank you. Uh, so my wife, when we started dating, my wife had grown up in a multicultural neighborhood. And when we started dating, she said, uh, just so you know, I'm a city girl. I'm, I'm used, I grew up in the city in a diverse environment. And I just, if you're going to get with me, you're going to get with the city kind of <laughs> thing. It was kind of an interesting thing. So she kind of gave me that ultimatum of sorts. It was a, a word from the Lord really is what the Lord gave her and yeah. invited me into a space where I was on a learning journey then to be like, okay, what does that mean? And how do I have to learn? And so and were you following Jesus? Like, were you that? Yeah, okay, at that I was time, committed were, to the Lord, but this okay. was, this felt like a different journey with the Lord. Okay. Like it felt like, okay, most Christians are like, okay, salvation. We got the salvation journey, but then this is like a second conversion, like a, another eyes scales falling from my eyes and eyes being open to something that I had missed in my discipleship that I've missed in my Christian formation was understanding God's heart for justice and God's passion for the poor and, and so these kind of themes had not been part of my discipleship mm. growing up. So in 1997, I got to go to a, um, an anti-racism class that was taught actually by people of the Baha'i faith. So it wasn't even Christians who were doing this, shame on us, but uh, a beautiful witness to me of how to see the world through without my white colored glasses a little bit. So trying to take those off and see the world a little bit more clearly. And I had a num number of mentors. I started seeking out African-American mentors who could help me uh, understand. And that it did put me on a posture of a, a learner that, um, that I was needing to be on. And so those, those people and those journeys through the years brought me to a place where I was like, okay, I know enough to know that I don't see everything as clearly as I should. So I'm, I've been on a learning journey since then to try to um, un dismantle the white supremacy that's been built into me and then to speak for justice and to be part of the dismantling of that in systems and in communities particularly the church is my calling but to try to dismantle that in those systems that it's been so entrenched for so many years how's that going <laughs> uh, slowly it's going 
it's, a, it's a calling that I know I will not see the fulfillment of mm. in my lifetime. I, I, uh, I pray not. That hurts. I'm that sorry. Hurts. Yeah. I'm sorry. I know I'm with you. Yeah. It hurts. Um, There's kernels of hope, but it's also yeah. feels like, like especially in these the last The hope is good, years. though. It is. It's necessary. You know I mean? yeah. The hope is yeah. there, for real. It's necessary. Like, yeah. if I, I didn't have operate. the hope, no, man. Yeah. 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 It's, it, it's, it's, it's rough that with all that we get to experience when you think about the pain, suffering, sin that is in the world, that the place that we fear will not overcome inflicting pain, suffering, fear, and sin, right, in this way and on this subject matter of race, racism, um, it's, it's in the church, right? Like, it, that's, a, that's a rough reality. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Some people's white supremacy in their Christian journey is so intertwined that they don't know how to separate it. Mm. Yeah. It's been so connected that they feel like one and the same to people. Yeah. And that, then you start talking about it and people are like, wait a minute, you're not talking about Jesus. Yeah. Mm. Like, that's where people are like. As oh. if we're talking about Jesus when we start doing the U.S. as a Christian country oh, or land. whatever. Oh, when we mercy. talk about, like, patriotism. As if yeah. that's talking about the Messiah himself. No. Right? Yeah. Um, but yet, we are called to love in that space as well. Um, one of the things that I, I appreciate is your posture even there. Like, understanding how jacked up we are in that space. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I see happen as someone learns a little bit, right, as the scales come off, mm -hmm. they end up angry probably even at themselves for being ignorant for so long, and they go back and bash people that feel the way they did yesterday, right? And expect them to get it. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, yeah. I see black people do it, but I see yeah. white people that just learned something about overcoming their own biases and racism. I see them go back, go back hard on white people. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, um, and then we're all frustrated when people don't come along and get it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But I, I see you move a little bit differently um, with conviction, but also like being patient with people on the journey. And I think that that allows people to become more open. Um, you know, if you have a the way I, I typically say it is if you have a teacher that is going to like hold you on the shoulder and gently correct you during the lesson is a lot different from a teacher that's sitting there waiting on you to get it wrong and going to beat you down for getting something wrong that yeah. you just don't know. And nobody's ever taught you to begin with. Yeah. And I don't think anybody, we should expect anybody to want, that type of lesson. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And people yeah. are scared. They're they're like scared to do the wrong thing or say the wrong of thing. Course. And so that they're yeah. waiting to get beat down in some cases. Yeah. Yeah. And probably should be. But yeah. to your point, the our our um the way that we move in that can open up conversation and dialogue that can produce real change. Yeah, and I've seen sure. that in your God's given you the grace to do that as well that I've really admired when it's so painful to go into those spaces and hear people say things. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's rough, but it's worth it at the end yeah. of the day, yep. right? Like yep. if you experience freedom yourself and you're able to help somebody else, right? Because in this space, on this subject matter, as it becomes less avoidable, right? If you think about giving to the poor, right? Like our white brothers and sisters in the suburbs are the poor. Yes. If this, if this subject matter is of value, yes. right? And the wealth will exist in Ken, right? And like being able to go and give and offer in that way, um, there's need and there's responsibility. Yes. And it's not fair. Yes. You know I mean? Yes. So, yeah. You've yeah, lived, go ahead, Ken. No, I just live by this rule that I came up with, you know, when I'm in that kind of space, you know, and you, you're up against, you're in those difficult conversations and people have their opinions you know, something I thought of and came up with is I put their perspective in a corner. Ooh, Not this is going to be good. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Preach. 
Go ahead. <laughs> I put that, I put that perspective in the corner and not them in the corner. Yeah. He says this. That's why I'm. That's why. <laughs> He's that's, been your teacher. This is one of his things. That's why I said it like that. <laughs> oh lord. <laughs> <laughs> he always saying I steal his ideas. So you know. I got so. you. It's inside. Yeah. <laughs> but no, it's really. But but that is something that he says, which is you know extremely true, right? Yeah. And that's putting. Um, some of perspectives, you know, in the corner, not them. Right. Yeah. So the first time I heard him say that, I was like, wow, you know, that is, that is true. Yeah. You know I mean, because so often we are like, oh, you know, and I remember him, him and I had a conversation a long time ago, years ago. It was about uh, some when Trump situation. And one of my friends said something about Trump. I was like, dude, I'm done messing with him. I ain't talking to him no more. I don't even know if you remember that. He was like, uh, I don't know, Ken. He was like, you know, that's his. I'm like, what's wrong with this Dewan dude? Like, why he, you know what I mean? Like, why, you know, but just us talking to it, and it took me a while to get where where he was going with it, you know what I mean? His thought about it was like, look, that's your friend, that's your friend, put his perspective in the corner, not him. You know what I mean? And you can still, and that's how you come to an understanding by keeping dialogue open, mm -hmm. but you can't keep dialogue open if you say, I'm done messing with you, I ain't talking to you no more because you believe something different than I believe, yeah. right? Yeah. And so that was... Just something um, valuable uh, that he shared with him, but it's a, a very valuable lesson that you know we should think about when we in those uh, difficult conversations. For sure. yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's 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 a heavy burden trying to educate kids. <laughs> 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 no um, action, right? So you and I had a conversation, and it was probably. I don't know. I'm not good at keeping track of the years, to be honest. But you and I had a conversation about reparations, mm -hmm. and you approached me. Mm -hmm. And you asked me to help you and Kristen think about what reparations could look like for you personally, yep. right? And I think if I remember correctly, you shared, probably not in these exact words, that your thoughts as a family was, even if, the country does not decide to grant re reparations, that doesn't excuse you of the personal responsibility too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where'd y'all, like that's different level. That's yeah. next level. Like that's that conversation level. gave me hope at a different level, hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Cause that's different level. I have a lot of like white friends that are really friends. Like I, I don't just, say that they're friends just for the figure of speech are really friends mm -hmm. that are different at different places on this journey. Mm -hmm. That's next level. And I always wonder how far are people willing to go with us on this journey because the cost associated with this for us is my son, right? Mm -hmm. You can relate to mm -hmm. having a black son, right? Mm -hmm. Police brutality looks like the worst call one could possibly get if we don't speak up against these things. Yes. So I always, that's where I'm always wondering and trying to gauge and sometimes asking my friends, how far are you going to go on this journey, right? Like what's your exit, yep. you know what I mean? Yep. So to have that conversation, this was really, took, took it to another level for me. So how did you all end up at that point? Yeah, um, so I, when, when Kristen invited me into this journey of, of understanding God's heart more, um, I started searching the scriptures and suddenly I started to see that God's heart wasn't just for diversity. God, <laughs> although like it's good yeah. for us to be together and yeah. in proximity is where we can understand each other better. Yep. Yep. But God's heart was for justice mm -hmm. and justice was the end goal, yeah. not just diversity. Yeah. And so when I started reading the scriptures through that lens, I started seeing the Old Testament prophets speaking to that. And then I saw stories like Zacchaeus in the New Testament. When Zacchaeus encountered Jesus, he was a tax collector. He had been making money mm -hmm. off of his own people for years. And, and then when, when he encountered Jesus, he went back and he obeyed the Old Testament law, which is when you've stolen from somebody, you pay them back four times the amount. Mm. So suddenly I'm like, oh, that... When I, when I had the scales drop from my eyes and I started realizing how I econ economically benefit, mm -hmm. economically, I'm not just talking about like, I mean, with the police is one thing, which that needs to be addressed, but economics are a component of this where I personally benefit 
at the expense of my brothers and sisters with darker skin, then I start going, oh my gosh, we've got to do something about this. There has to be something to address. And again, uh, this kind of came to my, to my mind when I was uh, speaking with Tony McDuffie, and we were doing this kind of collaborative training for a suburban uh, church group. And I started talking about how uh, we have a family company that uh, Kristen's grandfather started with his brothers back in the early 1900s. And when they started this company, um, they had access to bank loans. They had access to free movement to be able to sell, to be able to build relationships. They could move freely through the country. They had uh, networks, built-in networks that allowed them freedom to be able to build this business and watch it grow. So Kristen and I are today receiving quarterly benefit checks from this stock that her mm. grandfather did that we didn't do anything to earn. We did no work for it. He did work, right. yeah. but I'm, I'm teaching this and I'm saying this is the economic difference that justice means. And Tony's sitting, sitting right next to me and I'm realizing Tony's grandfather didn't have those same opportunities yeah. Yeah. for the generational wealth to be passed down for this, for this growing economic kind of movement surge to come into us. And so as soon as I started teaching that with Tony standing next to me, suddenly I was like, oh, we've got to do something different with that money. Mm. And so when that money started coming in, I was like, okay, how can we strategically use this financial means to be able to address issues that, that um, would promote justice? So that's kind of the journey that we've been on to be able to understand that. It was a biblical journey for me, but then it was transformed when I started thinking about practically, what does this look like? Mm. And, and if we wait for the government to give reparations, First of all, they need to, but uh, For sure. But if we're waiting on that, uh, we might be waiting too long. But regardless, the church should be rising up in this. Why does the church have to wait for the government to do something when we see the injustice? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So for me, I'm like, we need to address this. It needs to be personal. And if I can do that myself out of my own bank account, or if, if we can together, and then if we can uh, encourage others to think like that and encourage yeah. others to be... Um, walking in that same spirit, that, that starts a surge and we can start momentum that can address some of these things. So that's really my heart on that uh, issue of reparations and journey of justice. Hmm. Pretty dope, Mark. Pretty dope guy, brother. Thank you, Ken. <laughs> Pretty dope guy. Yeah. By the grace of God and by friends who have taught me through the years, yeah. I'm grateful. So I'll t I'll talk, can I talk a little bit about the day, uh, Ken? I, I may have told you the story because I remember being like, like, yeah, geeked about, it was really kind of early in our stages as an organization, so it was a donation to Black Leaves Detroit, but me and Mark was just trying to catch up with each other. It was kind of like pandemic, it caused all of our connect, uh, connections with each other and interactions to kind of be virtual, and then uh, I think I reached out or you reached out, I can't remember, it was like, yo, what's up, like, let's connect, and he was like, we can connect virtually or I can come to your hood and we can just go for a walk, or you can come mm -hmm. to my hood and go for a walk. And I was like, bet, I'll just come through that way. Um, so went, connected with them, and did a walk around Tez's old neighborhood. Shout out to Tez. Uh, West Philadelphia. Third Street, Car Philadelphia Cardiac Street. Films. Yeah. yeah, yep. So we were walking up third and uh, second, down up to, I can't remember what street, then back up third and whatnot. But as we were, we were talking, we were really catching up on our families and how our families were doing and whatnot and how we were doing. Um, you know how co crazy COVID was for everybody. And then at a certain point, Mark was like, man, I want to talk to you about something and I don't want to make it weird. You know what I mean? I don't want it to be weird. And that's when he talked to me about um, him and Kristen wanting to make um, a nice donation. I won't give, give their business away. Um, but if you're looking to do what they did, make sure it's a nice one. <laughs> uh, you know, but they want to, to make a, a donation as an act of reparations. Mm. Um, and like, you know, I can't remember what my response was, but that's never re weird to me. I'm definitely for You'd probably different. Say it like about time. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably what you said. <laughs> Righteously, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, like, that is, you know, something I strongly believe in. Um, and, and, so, and did he, and did Mark actually say in reparations? Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, he used the word. Right. That's he used like, the word. yeah. Like, dope. 
yes. right to here. Yes. Like, I'm going to give you 10 grand and you thinking that I want to do, but you ain't going to call it that because you don't want right. to call it that. Right. Because you want to put it out there. Yeah, and I owe you reparation it. for yeah. anything, right? But to name it, yes, yeah. that's, that's that's dope. Good job, Mark. Dope. Good, Good job. job. Good job for you and your wife, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's a biblical concept, right? right. Repairing what was broken. That's okay. It. Like the, it's it's a restorative justice kind of thing. We're not just yeah. trying to uh, do some cheap kind of exchange of forgiveness right. without any tangible kind of restoration. So the the restoration it, it has to be tangible. There has to be a cost to that. Yeah. Now, how did y'all meet? Can you remember? Matt Hale put us together. Matt Hale, yeah. yeah he yeah. saw we had similar thoughts and hearts about the church and about justice, and yeah. so he connected us. Yep, yeah. Yep. yeah, I remember that. I remember he was like, man, you got to meet my friend Mark. Y'all think a lot alike, and I think, I think Matt envisioned us both preaching somewhere together <laughs> and then whatnot. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, don't, we <laughs> preach, it's just in yeah, different, different, not different from a yeah, pulpit. Yeah, right, so not from a yeah, pulpit. Yeah, man, I can imagine y'all preaching. Yeah, That'd yeah. be... <laughs> <laughs> y'all have a mega church. All of a sudden, y'all done, everything y'all done did and went in a whole different direction because y'all, y'all got a, a big mega church. Oh, yeah, right. Y'all definitely can do it. Yeah, I don't know if that's in the cards for us. So. Yeah, we would probably so. do the split before it grew too big. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, to begin with. But, man, yeah, this, is, this has been good. Um, can I add one more thing? Definitely. Um, not only... So one of the reasons I believe in Black Leaders Detroit specifically is because me as a white man coming into the neighborhood and seeking to do good, to do justice work, to do community development, that stuff is like great. And all of a sudden I've got all kinds of people in the suburbs and outside the city who are like, hey, let's support Mark in this work. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's been fairly easy now by the grace of God and I trust by faith that God is putting his hand of blessing yeah. on our ministry. But it's been fairly easy for me to raise support. And much easier than my black counterparts who are tr doing the exact same things, even better than I'm doing. But for me, the financial pieces come easier. So even in that, that's why I'm such a believer in Black Leaders Detroit, because I'm like, OK, I'm trying to be a white leader in Detroit or whatever. Right. Like I'm trying to live my life faithfully to God's call in the neighborhoods. But I also realize that even in that, there's injustice in the ministry space and in this space of, of starting things. And so I see colleagues who do the work that I do better than me, but they're less funded because of uh, the systemic issues that we're addressing. So I just believe wholeheartedly in, in BLD, and I, I really am thankful that you've walked in obedience to start this. And it's so beautiful to see it growing and thriving in a way that it is and supporting so many people to really elevate the the people who have been doing the good work in this city for so long. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, man. Appreciate that. Appreciate, um, yeah, just you and Kristen mm -hmm. and the way that y'all navigate and move again, man. It's been, um, it's been one of the things that continues to feed the, the hope in me when that fire is flickering and, and getting dim. Like, I have enough stories to combat the other stories, mm -hmm. right, from personal experience and proximity to people with, with real friendships like y'all. You know what I mean? Thank so, you. Thank so, glad you. to be on this journey with you. Thank you. Yeah. Can That's I pick important up? to have those, those conflicting stories because there's good and bad people everywhere, every race, every culture, right? Yep. Yeah. And so, it's good when you have those that um, counterbalance the good that counterbalances the bad, right? So, that is very good. I, I had one more thing to say. Sorry, yeah. you made reference. No, you made reference to my son. Hey, you want to? You a guest? You can say. <laughs> uh, I know you got a time window, but um, you mentioned my son. Uh, my youngest son is black. He was adopted when he was a baby, and um, for us, that has been a significant part of our journey. And transracial adoption is complicated. I'm not trying to do a commercial for it, and it's done so poorly, so often. Mm -hmm. So I don't. In fact, I I don't think I could be a proponent of it. But we've tried to put ourselves in a position where we're doing it as best as we can, considering the circumstances and, and leaning into relationships that can help uh, help him become a faithful black man um, that I can't teach him how to do that. But he has models and ex uh, other people that he can look to and learn from. 
and um, he needs to learn how to do his hair, right? I can't teach him that. You can't teach him that either. Cause no, you can't. <laughs> can't. Don't come to Duan for that one. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But uh, No, you're not. <laughs> it's rough. I can't man, teach man, you. I can teach him probably teach better. Him how, I can teach him how to let it go. <laughs> <laughs> but really, to, like that that has been a valuable thing. And when he got his driver's license, we have to have the talk with him. And okay. I, mean, I mean, we've had to have the talk with him before, like even playing with guns in the yard outside side you know like yeah. st stuff like that that i wouldn't have had to consider for my other sons who are white and so that's been another part of our journey that's been complicated and also uh, god's been gracious to us and we've had so many good people or a community surrounding us that's been helping us with that so um it is difficult but by god's grace we're trying to walk in that spirit of justice and righteousness with the people that we're in community with yeah. how old is your son he uh, he turns eighteen this week. Nice, nice, yep. nice. And then you say you have more. You have other kids. I have two older sons who are biological. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Nice, yep. nice, nice. Oh yeah, I think you 18. said that. You started with that. You said twenty six, twenty two. It's and tw twenty two, twenty and eighteen. Yeah. Twenty yep. two, yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Man, I can't believe it's that old, man. Yeah. yeah. Man. Well, the time go. You speaking of that, you know what tomorrow is, don't you? I know what tomorrow <laughs> is, but so by the time our viewers are viewing this. It'll be tomorrow. You've crossed yep. over half be, a century. Well, is it? Wait, this is yeah. yeah it'll be du it'll be tomorrow. tomorrow, right? Yeah. So it's Dewan Say Day. <laughs> <laughs> so tomorrow is Dewan Say Day. Officially, <laughs> November 9th is Dewan Say Day. So make yes. a donation yes. to Black Leaders Detroit yes. for yeah. Dewan Say Day. <laughs> yeah. yes. he Reason why we call him Dewan he Say. Loves saying that. Cause he likes to change clothes. Cut his, cut his volume <laughs> off, <fans>. <laughs> <laughs> This is the most outfit changing this dude for one event I've ever met. <laughs> you got awesome. uh, what, a dollar a week to Black That's Leaders it. Detroit. A dollar a week. That's it. You can sacrifice that for Dewan Say Day. And for those who can do more, do more. That's it. Those who want to make reparation, talk to me. <laughs> That's it. That's it. No doubt. No doubt. So. We hope y'all have enjoyed this conversation. We hope you learned something from it. Um, we would love to continue the dialogue. So feel free to drop a comment if you have a question for Mark, question for me, question for Ken, because um, we this is the world that we live in, and this is a conversation that's really near and dear to us um, as individuals, the organization Black Leaders Detroit. We are about justice and connecting with people that believe in fairness enough to donate dollar or more a week to Black Leeds Detroit. Thanks for hanging out with us. We'll see y'all next time on Speak for Yourself. Peace.